back to your scriptures, go back to your Vedas and realize that God is one. Division in Islam is prohibited. We understand the concept of God in Hinduism. Quran is the most positive book. Every day, more than 3,000 fetuses are being aborted in India after they identified that they're females. According to the statutes of 1996, U.S. Department of Justice, 2,730 women are being raped every day. Every 32 seconds, one woman is being raped. I've been raped in U.S. until the time I'm here. Islam has the solutions to the problems of the West. Of the West. Yeah. No minni la tadani ya ahi Ya shaqi qawmuhi minni ahi الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد. I welcome you with the standard greetings of Islam. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. May peace, blessings, and mercy of Almighty God be upon you all. I, Abu Sharis bin Sarajun Hoda, is honored to be your MC tonight. Islamic Council of Selangor proudly presents. Dr. Zakir Naik, Malaysia Tour 2012. This event started last night with the topic of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in World's Religious Scriptures in Johor Bahru, 28 September yesterday. Brothers and sisters, Malaysia being truly multiracial and multi-religious country, it is very important for us to promote inter-religious understanding and harmony among us. For this very reason, we have organized this event, the tour of Dr. Zakir Naik into Malaysia. With this, upkeeping the tradition of Peace TV and IRF, I would like to welcome our Qari today, Brother Muhammad, to read the Surah Al-Imran, Surah number 3, Ayat number 64. Please join me to welcome the Qari, Brother Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi minash
Subhanallah. I would like to thank Brother Muhammad for his beautiful recitation. I would like now to present to you the translation of the recital by Brother Muhammad, which was Surah Ali Imran, Surah number 3, Ayat number 64. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Say, O people of the book, come to common terms as between us and you, that we worship none but Allah, that we associate no partner with him, that we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. If then they turn back, say you, bear witness that we are Muslims. Sadaqallahu al-Azim. Inshallah, after this, we will be having a talk from our first speaker, which is Brother Farid Naid. The talk will be for 45 minutes. Insha'Allah, after that will be the arrival of our main speaker, Dr. Zakir Abdul Karim Naik. After the talk of Dr. Zakir Naik, Insha'Allah, there will be a question and answer session for about two hours, which will be moderated by Brother Shah Kirit. And we will have the end of program after the question and answer session. The woman's right in Islam based on the authentic sources that is the glorious Quran and the authentic Hadith. We have no option but to agree that the women's right in Islam they are modernizing and they are not outdated. I thank Brother Farid Naik for his comprehensive and confident talk. Now we come to the part for which we have all gathered today. Let me introduce to you our main speaker tonight, Dr. Zakir Naik, a medical doctor by professional training, a dynamic international orator on Islam and comparative religion. Dr. Zakir Naik is the president of Islamic Research Foundation, Mumbai, India. Dr. Zakir clarifies Islamic viewpoints and clears misconceptions about Islam using the Quran, authentic Hadith, and other religious scriptures as a basis in conjunction with reason, logic, and scientific facts. He is famous for his critical analysis and convincing answers to challenging questions by audiences after his public talks. In the last 16 years, Dr. Zakir Naik has delivered more than 1,500 public talks in USA, Canada, UK, Italy, major parts of the Middle East, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Botswana, Singapore, Hong Kong, Thailand, Guyana, Trinidad, Mauritius, and many other countries, including our beloved Malaysia in addition to numerous talks in India itself. Dr. Zakir Naik was featured in the Indian Express list of the 100 most powerful Indians in 2009 and again in 2010. In the special list in 2009 of the top 10 spiritual gurus in India, Dr. Zakir Naik was ranked at number three. Dr. Zakir Naik has been placed in the top 62 in the list of the 500 most influential Muslims in the world published by the George Washington University in the United States of America. Dr. Zakir Naik appears regularly on many international TV channels in more than 200 countries in the world. Ideology and driving force behind Peace TV Network is Dr. Zakir Naik. He launched Peace TV English in January 2006, it being the largest watched Islamic as well as religious satellite TV channel presently in the world with over viewership of 100 million of which 
more than 25% are non-Muslims. In its footsteps, he launched Peace TV Urdu in 2008, Peace TV Bangla in 2011. Wow! I will be lying to you if I tell you I am not happy standing here before you today. I am thrilled, I am truly honored to welcome our beloved brother, Dr. Zakir Naik, to the stage to deliver his talk on the topic, Universal Brotherhood. Let us show Dr. Zakir Naik our Malaysian hospitality. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Zakir Naik to the stage. Malaysia, I give you Dr. Zakir Naik. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam. Ala Rasulillah wa ala Ali wa sahabi ajmain. Amma abad. A'uzu billahi min shaitani rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya ayyuhan nasu inna khalaqnaakum min zakrin wa unsa wa jalnaakum. Shu'uba wa qaba ila li ta'arafu. Inna karmaku min dallahi atkakum. Inna laha alimun khabir. Rabbi shali sadri. Wa yassilli amri. Wa halul ugdata min lisani yafkau kawli. My special elders and my dear brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, be on all of you. This is my fourth lecture tour to Malaysia. I had been earlier thrice before, in 96, 98, and 2001, and I'm coming again after a span of about 11 and a half years. And it's a pleasure for me to be back in Kiel, in Kuala Lumpur. <laughs> the topic of this evening's talk is Universal Brotherhood. There are various different types of brotherhood. Brotherhood based on blood relationship. Brotherhood based on region, based on race. Brotherhood based on caste, on creed, on color. But all these brotherhoods, they are limited and they are not universal. And Islam does not believe that human beings should be divided based on color and caste. I started my talk by quoting a verse of the glorious Quran from Surah Hujurat, chapter number 49, verse number 13, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhan nasu inna khalaqnaakum min zakrin wa unsa wa ja'alnaakum shu'uba wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu inna karmakum inda Allah yatkakum inna Allah alimun khabir. Oh humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female and have divided you into nations and tribes so that you shall recognize each other. And you may not despise each other. And the most honored in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the person who has taqwa, the person who has got consciousness, piety, righteousness. Allah says in this verse that he has divided the human beings into different tribes so that you may recognize each other, not that you may despise each other. And the most honored in the sight of Almighty Allah is the person who has taqwa, God consciousness, righteousness, piety. Allah says in Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 22, that amongst his signs, he has created the heavens and the earth. And has created different languages and colors. Verily in it is a sign for those who understand. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created people in different colors, having different languages, 
so that we may recognize each other. And this is a sign for those who understand. Allah says in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 70, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَ بَنِي آدَمَ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored all the children of Adam, irrespective whether they are black or white, yellow or brown, rich or poor, they're coming from America or Malaysia or India or Pakistan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored all the Bani Adam, all the children of Adam. And besides Islam, there are other religions that believe that the humankind originated from a single pair of male and female, from Adam and Eve, may peace be upon them. But unlike Islam, the other religions, they believe it is the woman because of which humankind is born in sin. Because Eve, may Allah be pleased with her, she disobeyed God, that's the reason human beings are born in sin. In Islam, we do not put the blame only on the woman. In Islam, if you read the Quran, the blame is equally put on both of them. Allah mentions in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 19 to 27, where Adam and Eve, peace be upon them, both of them are addressed more than a dozen times. Both of them made a mistake, both of them repented, both were forgiven. The blame is equally put on both of them. There is not a single verse in the Quran which puts the blame only on Eve. May Allah be pleased with her. But there is a verse in the Quran which only singles out Adam, peace be upon him. Allah says in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 121, that Adam, peace be upon him, he disobeyed Allah. But if you read the Quran as a whole, the blame is equally put on both of them. There are other religions which say that because of the sin of the woman, pregnancy is a curse on the woman. And Almighty God, according to the other religions, they say that the woman bears labor pains in pain because of a sin. Pregnancy degrades the woman in other religions. But in Islam, it's the opposite. Pregnancy uplifts the woman. Allah says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 1, respect the womb that bore you. Allah says in Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 14, that we have ordained the human beings to be good to their parents. In travel upon travel did the mother bore them, and in years twin was the weaning. Allah says in Surah Aqaf, chapter number 46, verse number 15, we have enjoined on the human beings to be good to their parents. In pain did the mother bore you, and in pain did she give him birth. So pregnancy uplifts a woman, does not degrade her. And the beloved Prophet Muhammad said, said, it's a hadith in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 8, chapter number 2, book of Adab, hadith number 2, a man approached the Prophet and asked him that who deserves the maximum love and companionship in this world? The Prophet said, your mother. The man asked after that who? The Prophet repeated, your mother. The man asked after that who? Again, the Prophet said, your mother. The man asked for the fourth time, who next? Then the Prophet said, your father. In short, 75%, three-fourth of the love and companionship goes to the mother. 25%, one-fourth goes to the father. In short, mother gets the gold medal, she gets the silver medal, as well as the bronze medal. The father has to be satisfied with the mere consolation prize. I have to mention some things about women's rights in the lecture of Universal Brotherhood. Though my son, Farik, I believe, may have done more justice to this topic. I just want to mention again that in Islam, men and women are equal. But equality does not mean identicality. They're equal, but they are not identical. In some aspects, the men have a degree of advantage. In some aspects, the women have a degree of advantage. And I have to repeat the example given by my son, that if in a class, two students A and B, both get 80 out of 100, both come out first in the class, and if we analyze the answer sheet, there are 10 answers to 10 questions. 
in answer to question number one, student A gets 9 out of 10. And student B gets 9 out of 10. So student A had the degree of advantage over B in answer number one. In answer to question two, student B gets 9 out of 10, and student A gets 9 out of 10. So in answer to question number two, student B had the degree of advantage over A. All the remaining answers from question number three to question number 10, all the remaining eight answers, both A and B, get eight out of 10. So if you add up, student A also gets 80 out of 100, student B also gets 80 out of 100. But student A has the advantage over B in answer number one, and student B has the advantage over A in answer number two. But overall, both are equal. Similarly, in Islam, men and women are equal, but equality doesn't mean identicality. In some aspects, the men have a degree of advantage. In some aspects, the women have a degree of advantage. For example, if a robber enters my house, I will not tell my wife or my daughter, go and fight because I believe in women's liberalization, I believe in equality. Since Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 34, that Allah has given more strength to the male as compared to the female. So here in strength, the men have a degree of advantage and it's their duty that they have to protect the woman. As far as love and companionship of the children to the parents are concerned, as I quoted the hadith earlier, the mother has three times more advantage as compared to the father. So overall men and women in Islam are equal, but equality does not mean identicality. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who we believe is Almighty God, is not exclusively God only for the Muslims or the Arabs. He is Almighty God for all the worlds, for all the human beings. Whether black or white, yellow or brown, rich or poor, whichever part of the world they live in. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Fatiha, chapter number one, verse number two, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Praise be to Allah, the Lord of the worlds, Lord of all the worlds. Allah says in Surah Nas, chapter number 114, verse number one. Pull out be Rabbin Nas. Rabbin Nas, he is the Lord of humankind, of all the human beings. We believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Lord of all the human beings. And there are guidelines given in the Quran to promote universal brotherhood. Allah says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 32, if anyone kills any other human being, unless it be for murder, or for spreading corruption in the land, it is as though you have killed the whole of humanity. And if anyone saves a single human being, it is as though you have saved the whole nation. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that if you kill any other human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, unless it be for murder or for spreading corruption in the land, if you kill any innocent human being, it is as though you have killed the whole of humanity. And if you save any human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, it is as though you have saved the whole nation, all the human beings. Therefore, murder is one of the major sins in Islam. This disrupts universal brotherhood. Therefore, Islam prohibits it. Killing any innocent human being is prohibited. Allah also says that robbing is prohibited. Allah says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 38, that man and woman should not rob. And the third pillar of Islam is zakat. That is, every rich human being who has a saving of more than the nisab level, more than 85 grams of gold, he or she should give 2.5% of that excess wealth in charity every lunar year. If every rich human being in the world gives zakat, poverty will be eradicated from this world. There will not be a single human being who will die of hunger. Zakat and charity increases the universal brotherhood and decreases the gap between the rich and the poor. Allah 
Allah says in Surah Ma'un, chapter number 107, verse number 1 to 7. Allah says in Surah Ma'un, chapter number 107, verse number 1 to 7. See thou not the one who denies the day of judgment, who treats the orphan with harshness, and does not encourage the feeding of the indigent. Woe to those who are neglectful of the prayers. Woe to those who pray only to be seen by men. And they do not even provide neighborly needs. So Allah says, if you provide neighborly needs, it encourages brotherhood. It's the duty of Muslims to help the neighbors. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that he is not a Muslim who sleeps with his full stomach while the neighbor is hungry. That means Islam does not give you permission to sleep with a full tummy when your neighbor is hungry, when your neighbor doesn't have food to eat. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 26 and 27, that do not be a spendthrift, do not be extravagant in spending money. For verily, a spendthrift is the brother of the devil. So if you are a spendthrift, it discourages universal brotherhood. And being a spendthrift is a sign of the brother of the devil. Allah says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 188, that spend not your wealth as a bait for the judges in order to eat up other people's wealth. Here Allah says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 188 that bribing is prohibited, which is very common in the world today. If you bribe, it disrupts the universal brotherhood. Allah says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5 verse number 90, Ya ayyuh al-lazeen amunu, O you who believe, inna mal khamru wal maisiru, most certainly intoxicated in gambling. Well, Ansab al Aslamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, rich from minimally shaitan. These are Satan's handiwork. First, the Nibula Lukum to Flihun. Abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. Ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying that alcohol, gambling, dedication of stones, fortune telling, all these are Satan's handiwork. Abstain from it that you may prosper. All these things, it disrupts the universal brotherhood. Alcohol, gambling, fortune telling, dedication of stones. If you stay away from all these evil acts, which are signs of the devil, it will increase the universal brotherhood. Allah says in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 32, Come not close to adultery, for it is a shameful deed, and evil opening other roads to evil. Adultery is prohibited in Islam. And Allah says in Surah Hujurat, chapter number 49, verse number 11 and 12, Allah says, let not one group of men laugh at the other. You may never know that the latter may be better than the former. Let not one group of women laugh at the other. You may never know the latter may be better than the former. Do not call each other with offensive nicknames. Do not spy on one another. Do not backbite. Are you ready to eat the meat of your dead brother? Here Allah says that if you backbite, if you speak against someone behind his back, it is as though you are eating the meat of your dead brother. Eating the meat of human being is haram, but eating dead meat is double haram. Even the cannibals, they do not eat the meat of their own brothers. So here Allah says that if you backbite, it is as though you are eating the meat of your dead brother. And Allah says in Surah Humuza, chapter number 104, verse number 1, Why lulli kulli humazatil lumaza? Woe to every kind of scandal monger and backbiter. These are guidelines given in the Quran to promote universal brotherhood. But besides talking about universal brotherhood, Islam says you should exhibit universal brotherhood minimum five times every day in your practical life. I'm talking about the second pillar of Islam, that is Salah. When we offer Salah, we practically demonstrate universal brotherhood five times a day. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, in the book of Adhan, 
chapter number 75, hadith number 692, where Hadith Anas, Melabi Prism said, that when we stood for Salah, the shoulder of the companions touched the shoulder of the other companion, and a feet touched the feet of the companion. The beloved Prophet said, it's mentioned in Sunan Abu Dawud, volume number one, in the book of Salah, chapter number 245, hadith number 666, that the Prophet, before starting Salah, he said, that close in your gaps, stand shoulder to shoulder, and do not leave any gap for the Satan. So when we offer Salah, it is compulsory that the Muslim, we should stand shoulder to shoulder and feet to feet, irrespective whether you're rich or poor, whether you're a king or a pauper. When you stand for Salah, you stand shoulder to shoulder, irrespective whether you're black or white, yellow or brown. When you stand for Salah, you stand shoulder to shoulder. We Muslims have to practically demonstrate universal brotherhood minimum five times a day. The other very good example of universal brotherhood is the fifth pillar of Islam, that is Hajj. The Hajj is the biggest annual gathering in the world. And during Hajj, nowadays, about four million people come from different parts of the world, from America, from Canada, from UK, from Malaysia, from Indonesia, from India, four million people. And the men, they are dressed up in two pieces of unsewn cloth, preferably white. You cannot differentiate the person standing next to you, whether he's a king or a pauper. When you're in Aram, the purpose of the Aram is that all of them, they wear the same clothes, two pieces of unsewn white cloth. You cannot identify the person standing next to you, whether he's a king or a pauper. And you say the talbiya, labbaik allama labbaik, labbaik allama labbaik. Here I come, oh my Lord, here I come at your service. More than 4 million people from different parts of the world, of different nationalities, different colors. They come only at the service of the Lord. That is the best example of universal brotherhood. The main cornerstone of the Islamic faith is that there is only one sole creator sustainer and cherisher for all the human beings. The cornerstone of Islamic faith is Tawheed, that there is only one sole creator, sustainer, cherisher for all the human beings, irrespective whether they are black or white, yellow or brown, rich or poor, whether they are from America or Malaysia, India or Pakistan. Our creator is the same. And this point is the single most important point for universal brotherhood. This point alone, that all the human beings have one sole common creator, sustainer, and cherisher, is sufficient for universal brotherhood. That's the reason, monotheism being the cornerstone of Islam, besides Islam, it is even the cornerstone of all the faiths. But unfortunately, in the passage of time, the importance to it deteriorated. That's the reason if you read the scriptures of all the major religions, all of them speak about believing and worshipping only one God. The Qari today started the program with the Kirat of Sul Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64, where Allah says, Kul Yahil al Kitab. Say, O people of the book. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah namza illallah. That we worship none but Allah. That we associate to partners with Him. That we erect not among ourselves. Lords and people other than Allah. Find Allah. If then they turn back. Fakula shadu. Say be witness. We are not Muslim. That we are Muslims bowing our will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This verse of the Quran gives you a master key of how to speak with different types of people. Come to common terms as with us and you. Which is the first term? Allah, not with the illallah. That we worship none but Allah. So when we speak with people of different religions, our creator says, talk about commonalities. The differences can be discussed later on. At least let us agree to follow what is common. 
and most of our problems will be solved. Religion, according to the Oxford Dictionary, means a belief in a superhuman controlling power, a personal God or gods that deserve worship. So basically, religion means believing in God. So if we can understand the concept of God in the major world religions, this is the best way to unite all the human beings together. So today, let us discuss the concept of God in the major world religions. So that we can promote universal brotherhood. First, we'll discuss the concept of God in Hinduism. If you ask a common Hindu, that how many gods does he believe in? Some may say three, some may say hundred, some may say thousand, while others will say 33 crores, 330 million. But if you ask a learned Hindu who is well versed with the scriptures, he will tell you that the Hindus should believe and worship only one God. But the common Hindu, he believes in a philosophy known as pantheism. Pantheism means that everything is God. The sun is God, the moon is God, the tree is God, the human being is God, the snake is God. What we Muslims believe that everything belongs to God, everything is God's. G O D with an apostrophe. Yes. Everything belongs to God. The sun belongs to God. The moon belongs to God. The tree belongs to God. The human being belongs to God. The snake belongs to God. So the major difference between the common Hindu and the common Muslim is the Hindu says everything is God. We Muslims say everything is God's. G O D with an apostrophe. Yes. If we can solve this difference of apostrophe, yes, the Hindus and the Muslims will be united. How do you do it? As Allah says in the Quran, Ta'ala ila kalimatin sawa in bayna baynakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illa Allah. That you worship none but Allah. So the major difference between the common Hindu and the common Muslim is the Hindu says everything is God. We Muslims say everything is God's. G O D with an apostrophe S. Yes. If we can solve this difference of apostrophe S, yes, the Hindus and the Muslims will be united. How do you do it? As Allah says in the Quran, Ta'ala ila kalimatin sawa in bayna baynakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illa Allah. That you worship none but Allah. Now, when we read the sacred scriptures of the Hindus, it's mentioned in the Upanishad. The Upanishad, the one of the higher category of sacred scriptures of the Hindus, it's mentioned in Chandogya Upanishad. Chapter number six, section number two, verse number one. Ikkam Ivdityam. God is only one without a second. It's mentioned in the Svetha Svetara Upanishad. Chapter number six, verse number nine. Nachas Yakasij, Janita Nachadipa. Of that God, he has got no parents, he has got no Lord. Almighty God has got no mother, no father, no superior. It's mentioned in Svetha Sitar Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 19, Na Patima Asti. Of that God, there is no Pratima. Pratima in Sanskrit means an image, an idol, a picture, a photograph, a painting, a sculpture, a statue. Of that God, there is no Pratima. Of that God, there is no image, no idol, no picture, no painting, no portrait, no statue, no sculpture. It's clearly mentioned in Svetha Sitar Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 20, that Almighty God is imageless. And amongst the Hindu scriptures, the most widely read scripture is Bhagavad Gita. It's mentioned in Bhagavad Gita. Chapter number 7, verse number 20. All those whose intelligence has been stolen by material desires, they worship demigods. That all those are materialistic people, they worship demigods. Gods besides the one true God. It's mentioned in Atharvaved, book number 20, hymn number 58, verse number 3. Dev Maha Asi, verily great is Almighty God. It's mentioned in Yajurved, chapter number 32, verse number 3. Na tasse patima asti. Of that God, there is no pratima. Of that God, he has got no images. 
no idol, no picture, no painting, no portrait, no sculpture, no statue. It's mentioned in Yajurve chapter number 40, verse number 8, that Almighty God, He is imageless and pure. It's mentioned in Yajurve chapter number 40, verse number 9, Andhatma Pavishanti Ya Asambuti Upaste. Andhatma means darkness. Pravishanti means entering. They are entering darkness, those who worship the Asambuti. Asambuti in Sanskrit means the natural things, water, fire, air. Yajurve chapter number 40 verse number 9 says, they are entering darkness, those who worship the Asambuti, the natural things like water, fire, air. And the verse continues, they are entering more in darkness, those who worship the Sambuti, those who worship the created things like table, chair, idols, etc. Who says that? Yajurve chapter number 40 verse number 9. The Vedas are the most sacred amongst all the scriptures of the Hindus. And amongst the Vedas, the most important, most sacred is Rig Ved. It's mentioned in Rig Ved, book number one, hymn number 164, verse number 46. Ikkam sat Truth is one, God is one. Sages and saints call him by different names. The same message repeated in Rig Ved, book number 10, hymn number 114, verse number 5, that God is one, but saints call him by a variety of names. And there are no less than 33 attributes given to Almighty God in Rig Ved, book number 2, hymn number 1 alone. One of these attributes is, in Rig Ved, book number 2, hymn number 1, verse number 3, is Brahma. Brahma is called as the creator god if you translate creator into arabic it means khalik we muslims have got no objection if someone calls almighty god as khalik or creator or brahma but if someone says brahma is almighty god who has got four heads and on each head is a crown we muslims take strong exception to it because you're going against Sveta Sveta Upanishad chapter number 4 verse number 19 which says Nartasya Pratima Asti of that God there is no Pratima there is no image there is no idol there is no picture there is no painting there is no portrait there is no statue there is no sculpture the other attribute given to Almighty God in Rig Ved, book number 2 hymn number 1 verse number 3 is Vishnu Vishnu is called as the sustainer God the cherisher. If you translate sustainer or cherisher into Arabic, it is somewhat similar to Rab. We Muslims have got no objection if someone calls Almighty God as Rab or cherisher or sustainer or Vishnu. But if someone says Vishnu is Almighty God who is traveling on a sea, on a bed of snakes, who has got four hands, on one hand is the chakra and flying on the bird by the name of Garuda, we Muslims take strong objection to it. And now going against the Ajurved, chapter number 32, verse number 3, which says, Na tasya pratima asti. Of that God, there is no pratima, there is no image, there is no idol, there is no picture, there is no portrait, there is no painting, there is no sculpture, there is no statue. It's further mentioned in Rig Ved, book number 8, hymn number 1, verse number 1. March is in the sansad. Do not worship him except the one and only. Praise him alone. It's mentioned in Rig Ved, book number 6, hymn number 45, verse number 16. It says, Ya ek is mushtihi. Praise him alone, one God. Only praise him. And the Brahma Sutra of Hinduism, the fundamental creed of Hinduism is, Ekkam Brahm Dyutya Naste. Nena Naste Kinchan. Bhagwan ek hai. Dusra nahi hai. Nahi hai, nahi hai, zara bhi nahi hai. There's only one God, not a second one. Not at all, not at all, not in the least bit. So if you read the Hindu scriptures, you'll understand the concept of God in Hinduism and understand Hinduism in the right perspective and that will help to increase the brotherhood between the Hindus and the Muslims. Let's try and understand the concept of God in Judaism. It's mentioned in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 6, verse number 4. Moses, peace be upon him, said, Shama Israelo It's a Hebrew quotation which means, Yoro Israel, the Lord, our God is one Lord. It's mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 43, verse number 11. I, even I, 
I am Lord and there is no savior besides me. It's mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 45, verse number 5. I am Lord and there is none like me. There is no God besides me. It's mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 46, verse number 9. I am God and there is none like me. I am God and there is no one besides me. It's further mentioned in the book of Exodus, chapter number 20, verse number 3 to 5. It says, Thou shall have no other God besides me. Almighty God is saying that thou shall have no other God besides me. Thou shall not make unto thee any graven image of anything, of any likeness in the heaven above, in the earth beneath, in the water beneath the earth. Thou shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, thy God, thy Lord, is a jealous God. These verses of the Bible strictly prohibit idol worship and making an image of God. Same is repeated. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 5, verse number 7 to 9, the Almighty God says, Thou shall have none other God besides me. Thou shall not make any graven image of any likeness of anything in the heaven above, in the earth beneath, in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, thy God, thy Lord, is a jealous God. So if you read the Jewish scriptures, you shall understand the concept of God in Judaism, and this will increase the brotherhood between the Jews, Christians, the Muslims, and the Hindus. Let's understand the concept of God in Christianity. Before I discuss the concept of God in Christianity, I would like to make a few points clear. Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith to believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believe that he was the Messiah, translated Christ. We believe that he was born miraculously without any male intervention, which many modern day Christians today do not believe. We believe that he gave life to the dead with God's permission. We believe that he healed those born blind and lepers with God's permission. The Christians and the Muslims, we are going together. But one may ask, then where is the parting of ways? The parting of ways is that most of the Christians believe that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was Almighty God and he claimed divinity. In fact, if you read the Bible, there is not a single unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that I am God or where he says worship me. I would like to repeat that if any Christian can point out a single unequivocal statement from any verse of the Bible, which is said by Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, where he says that I am God, or where he says worship me, I, Zakir Naik, am ready to accept Christianity today. I am not speaking on behalf of my other Muslim brothers, because this is my field of comparative religion. I am ready to put my hand on the guillotine. If any Christian can point out from any version of the Bible a single unequivocal verse in the Bible, a single unambiguous verse in the Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says that I am God or where he says worship me, I am ready to accept Christianity. <laughs> شقيق الروح مني أخي أخي يا شقيق الروح